All right, class, back at you here. A uh, little change of format. I want to, uh, I was going to create a lecture on some of the reform movements that occurred, and I will hopefully get to that. If not, that's what I'll spend the, the first or second day back to class doing is cover the different reforms. They're very important, but you're also getting those uh, with your flashcards that you're doing at home. And remember, there's going to be a test on the flashcards Monday morning. I think I gave you 34 people to look up, and I'm going to pick any 20 of those, and you have to be able to, just a simple matching test. So if you've done your homework, you've got the flashcards you're going to turn in. Those will be worth 20 points like a study guide. And uh, you got your two study guides that are due, chapter 15 and chapter 17. Um, well, the chapter on manifest destiny and the chapter on culture. So uh, that's what's coming up here. I, I found out and experimenting doing these things that you have to kind of record them in short chunks or else they're not going to load up very good for uh, YouTube. So that's what I'll be doing today. I'll be breaking those things up. A couple things you're going to need. <clears throat> your textbook, if you've got it, I'll be referring to that. Your election chart. And if you don't have that, not a great big deal because remember, if you got this, this is the election chart where I just copied over my notes for you. So you have them. You don't have to write anything down. I've already done that for you. But it would be helpful to uh, refer to that as I'm talking today. And then your lecture guide for Manifest Destiny. Here. So that's what I'm going to be following as I go through. I'm going to be referring to this lecture guide here. Where we're going to be filling in blanks as they go. Um, and so right at the very top where there's blank space, just want to remind you, like I did before the holiday. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> This lecture is sponsored by Baja Fresh. Wish we had one in Merced, but we don't. So. All right. <clears throat> so Manifest Destiny has a religious tone to it, if you will. Uh, and when I say that, uh, a lot of Americans felt like we were destined by God because of our great democratic institutions, because he wouldn't have made us so strong and powerful and able to beat all those Indians so easily. Uh, and those things, if he hadn't intended for us to have all of the continent from sea to shining sea, from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. And so there was this feeling. And you have an excellent picture on page 379. In fact, in, in reading the internet, it's, it's in Congress. So you can still, if you go to Washington, D.C., you can see it there. And, and, I, and it's you know a picture of settlers pointing west. We're, we're heading west, and you've probably heard the famous quote uh, throughout time, go west, young man, and a lot of people had. There's a, another picture that's like this, but very um, in, in different in one sense, in that there is an angel hovering above the settlers as they looked west, and the angel is pointing to the west like it's guiding them. So religious overtones, uh, regardless, there were a lot of Americans who felt like that we needed to get this, and, and, and that is all going to happen in the decade of the 1840s. So, uh, chapter 17, Manifest Destiny Lecture Notes, uh, has to do with the 1840s, and, and in that process, from the beginning to the end, we are going to have all of the land from sea to shining sea for ourselves, and, and that happens during this period. Quick refresher, chapter 13 was politics, the Jacksonian democracy era, Andrew Jackson, Chapter 14 covered economics and uh, the market economy, the market revolution that we had in the United States, the transportation revolution that connected the different sections of our country. Chapter 15 was all about culture and how our culture was changing, particularly in the impact of the Second Great Awakening and religion and, and uh, utopian societies and all that had to do for our country, socially speaking. Well, we skipped chapter 16 because that's on slavery, and we'll cover that in our uh, on our way to the Civil War. Chapter 17 is back to politics, right? Back to politics. The last election we covered, I believe, was the election of 1832. Uh, election of 1836. Now, I'm going to skip over that one. That's Martin Van Buren, and, and you've taken those notes. Those were in chapter 13, what happened. But uh, we definitely get the birth of the Whig Party. Uh, in earnest in the election of 1836. They're, they're defeated by Martin Van Buren, but they make their showing. Well, the election of 1840 okay, gets a highlight around it. It's our third election that gets a highlight, the election of 1800, which
which we call the Revolution of 1800, the election of 1824, uh, which we refer, refer to as the corrupt bargain. Okay? In the election of 1840, if you'll write it right up, well, I already written for you. It's the hard cider log cabin and hard cider campaign. Right? And in my notes, I have that it's the first modern election <laughs> where presidents actually have to get out and kiss babies, and maybe a few other things, and buy a few beers for people because now that the common man is voting, that's who they have to persuade to vote for them if they want to win the presidency. And these guys do want to win the presidency. So it's our first modern election with signs and banners and speeches and, and all of those things that go along with it. Uh, the candidates are Martin Van Buren okay, running for re-election. Uh, and he is a Democrat. And he is running against Old Tippy Canoe, a war hero. We love our war heroes from the War of 1812. William Henry Harrison, who defeated Tecumseh at the Battle of Tippecanoe. Right? Uh, like any modern uh, election, they have their campaign slogan, and William Henry Harrison's is, vote for Tippecanoe and Tyler too. Tyler was his vice presidential candidate, but old Tippecanoe, without a doubt, every good American knew who that was. Log Cabin and Hard Cider campaign. The Hard Cider, because you had to buy some Hard Cider for your for constituents if you wanted them to vote for you. But people had figured out uh, by watching Andrew Jackson that if you wanted to win an election, it would help that if you had common roots with the common people. So William Henry Harrison and the Whigs tried to pass him off like he was just a common man, born in a log cabin, just like Andrew Jackson, right? Uh, yeah, it was probably like a six-story log cabin. He had a born into pretty wealthy surroundings, but that's if that's what you had to do. Uh, that's what you had to do, all right? You can see that the campaign issues here are uh, very little, all right? Little discussion of solid issues. Democrats tried to talk, talk about the uh, the bank, the BUS, uh, uh, or at, not actually not the BUS, but Martin Van Buren's independent treasury that he had developed when he was president, and internal improvements in tariff, all right? But, but very little to do that, all right? Uh, and as you can see, okay, remember Martin Van Buren was president when the panic of 1837 hit, and uh, we know that if you're the president when a when a depression hits or a recession hits, you are not going to get reelected. And he's the first president to prove that to us, right? And solid butt whooping, William Henry Harrison, 234 electoral votes to Martin Van Buren, 60 electoral votes. Right? And herein we have the great presidential hit trivia. Because William Henry Harrison, like any true Jacksonian, is going to march to his inaugural address in the driving snow. There's a sleet storm, rain, sleet. He's already got pneumonia, but in order to be closer to the people, he's going to walk to the campaign, and uh, <laughs> on the way, his pneumonia gets work. He delivers a two-hour speech, and a month later, he will die from that very same pneumonia. So he holds the record for the shortest presidency. <laughs> uh, president for about 40 days when he passes away. So you can see there's a vice president that ascends to the presidency, and that is his, uh, John Tyler, which he will become referred to as his accidency right, because of that. Now, he this is the first president ever to die in office. Right? And funny, it, it's... The Constitution states that the vice president shall assume the role of the presidency. It doesn't say he will become the president. <laughs> and so John Tyler assumed the role of the presidency, but the Whigs hey, kind of figured, hey, Tyler, you sit over there and let us run the country, right? And we're talking, we're talking about the Whigs. Um, we're talking about all the guys that run that. Okay? Mr. Compromise himself, Henry Clay, is like itching at the bit to, to do things and run things. Um, and Tyler kind of surprises him uh, in that what I have in my notes there, if you read it, it turns out he is a Democrat in Whig's clothing. In other words, he's supposed to be a Whig, but when he takes over the presidency for William Henry Harrison, he is anything but a Whig. <laughs> and he's going to pretty much, uh, he's going to vote just the opposite on everything that the Whigs want him to do. So much so that his entire cabinet will resign on him, all the Whigs. They're going to kick him out of the Whig party. 
it, it, as far as that goes. So uh, anyway, that's that's enough. That's the election of 1840. I'm going to go ahead and take a break right now because, again, we've got to record these in small segments. Very good. And then uh, we'll move on to the next one. At that point, we'll go ahead and jump to your to your film or your lecture notes.